I'm Eric. Um, sorry. Oops, recording in progress. Um, and um, I'm one of the cinematographers on the project. Um, sorry, I, my shoot ran late today. I'm being an active cinematographer, so I'm in a car right now <laughs> with a big camera in my lap. Um, but um, yeah, it was a real pleasure to work on this film, and it's so fun to see the final realization of the product. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Ricardo Nunez. I'm uh, the Director of Economic Democracy at the Sustainable Economies Law Center and also um, Board President of your U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives, if you remember. And yeah, that's me. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so one of the one of the really great uh, honors and privileges that I had making this film was working with Meerkat Media, um, which as you know, is a worker owned co-op. And so I'm really excited to be able to interview you guys uh, and hear what you have to say. Uh, what do you have to say for yourselves? So um, maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, your, your co-op, like how did it get started? Why did it get started? Why are you guys a co-op? And then I'll ask a ton of follow-ups. Um, sure, I can, I can start with that one. Um, also just wanna say, I'm sure other folks um, have questions. Like I feel silly taking up space here. Like I want folks to ask Yale questions. So I really encourage people to put questions um, in the chat for Yale, um, just you know, for her to get an opportunity to share more about um, this project and her vision and all the work that went into it. Um, but um, yeah, I can just say really briefly, um, so Meerkat Media is a worker owned production company co-op that we, we started out as a arts collective, kind of very informal in 2005. Um, and then as we all kind of like, as uh, with the old goal of sort of supporting the individual members, creative work through um, mutual aid and shared resources. And then like, as we started to make a little bit of money, like investing those little bits of, of you know, surplus that we had back into this shared pot that would then go on to support, um, yeah, this kind of shared project, uh, which then grew into a more formal worker co-op, uh, which now does a lot of a mix of kind of commissioned, um, uh, doc, like, you know, future documentary work, as well as we do a lot of partnerships with production, um, with nonprofits and kind of mission aligned organizations for the most part um, uh, in New York and around the country. Um, and so then getting to partner with y'all on this film was like such a wonderful opportunity because um, obviously, you know, the topic of, you know, socialism is really near and dear to our hearts and, and just, you know, we are, we feel really passionately about making media that helps to, to shift the narrative, you know, around like what is possible, um, and um, you know, so that and that and and so you know, for us, the way that we think about our work is that we we want to shift those narratives, both in terms of what we make and also in terms of how we make things. Like, hopefully, also trying to kind of be a bit of a model for an industry that you know, for the most part, is very hierarchical, very. Um, you know, relies on a lot of exploitation of kind of folks that like, um, you know, the bottom of that hierarchy. And, um, and so, yeah, it was really great getting to work with y'all on this project and, you know, getting an opportunity to, to help to, to get some of these, these stories out there. Um, Eric, feel free to share and any, add anything else to that. Yeah, I think um, I'm really happy um, that uh, someone put that quote from Adrian Marie Brown in, in the chat. Um, I think when we, when y'all came to us and and we were brainstorming about what this project would be, the excitement was, wow, we can make a documentary about a topic that we think is so important. Uh, one that helps explain it, that helps get people aligned and interested in what the ideas are behind it, maybe pulls the, um, you know, the expectations uh, that you might bring to the equation away a little bit and gives a more real lens on it. Um, because you know we've been practicing these skill sets creatively for so long that we feel like you know it's it's a really great opportunity to be able to like put them to good use rather than you know something that maybe is a little more fluffy or won't get seen by many people so it, it felt like this really exciting opportunity so that that quote resonated with me because as we sat in that room together we were just like and what if we do this and what if this happens and where it could go and how it could be um and and i feel like that that process stayed true throughout the whole thing it kept feeling like whenever we went back to production or back into the edit or saw another iteration of it in some way it felt like 
an exciting opportunity, um, one that we were all really like thankful for and was like the kind of thing that we want to be doing. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there for now. <laughs> um, I have more questions about your guys' co-op. So Zara, I appreciate your humility. But I think uh, as, as, a, as a maker myself and someone who struggles, like you said, in an industry that really uh, does seem to be predicated on a lot of exploitation of labor and an equitable distribution of whatever resources there might be in this industry. Um, like, so did you guys, you were all friends and you were like, oh, let's start a co-op together or like you were already making stuff and you changed the entity, like sort of how did that progression, you know, happen? Feel free to take this one, Eric, if you want. Um, yeah, correct me when I mess it up. Um, <laughs> it's a long history. Um, we, we began as a organization of, um, of like like-minded artists and, um, very quickly we realized that we would succeed better if maybe we pooled our resources and our access to the different people within the creative communities that we all touched. Um, so the idea was let's combine forces so that whenever we're working on a project um, or we have an opportunity, people you know, have to just be that one freelancer that maybe gets manipulated or hired for too low a rate in some capacity. Instead, we can say, we're a full service shop. We're here to provide you a full filmmaking experience. Um, we have all the members of the team involved. Um, and from that kind of like uh, initial idea sprouted an organizational structure in which we really wanted to mirror the consensus process of communication that we had built our collective and artistic process around in which all voices are equal um, and we listen to um, everyone's input um, as much as possible, making sure that everyone kind of as Zara likes to say, hold hands and take a step forward together. Um, so that was the way that we, with that idea, we were like, okay, so what does that look like when it comes to like making an LLC or making decisions as a group? Um, yeah, Zara, do you want to take it from there? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I mean, I'll just say that like, so, you know, we've been around um, for, you know, as an, as a informally, you know, for 15 years as a co-op for over 10, which like in the scheme, you know, is not that long, but also like, you know, longer than like many of the co-op peers that we have, that we have, you know, so we've gone through a lot of uh, changes. We've learned a lot. Um, and, you know, I would say like, sort of like our cultural, like, I think like the cultures that we came out of. So yes, you know, to be totally transparent, like, yes, we were a group of friends 15 years ago when we started. Now there's only a handful of those folks around and most of the folks that are involved in the co-op have come through open calls. So it's like a very different, you know, kind of more professional environment now, but the kind of cultural home of like the folks that started it was like, kind of like, you know, college anarchist organizing and like community ensemble based theater. And so like, that was sort of like where we in that time, like, brought those particular like ways of working and those skill sets and then kind of like, apply them in like a, a way that we kind of made up into film. And then I think for me, it was around Occupy when there was like, I started to kind of hear more about worker co-ops in New York and kind of, we kind of realized at that point that like, oh, there actually is like a frame, there's, there is a model that exists for like, what we used to say is that we, we created the LLC as like the arm of the collective that could like engage with capitalism. And then like, we realized that like, oh, there's actually like the structure that exists that would give us all these tools to, um, yeah, to be able to like actually enact our values in a real way. Um, and so it, at that point, we just like learned a lot more about, about worker co-ops. We already had created an LLC, but we kind of moved more formally towards like making sure everyone was like, you know, their name was actually on it. And then, you know, really writing out an operating agreement that like, that made it possible to them like bring in new people for people to leave like what actually does happen to the surplus like all the things that were like kind of just like amorphous and like just like a shared understanding like we we, we formalized them so that, so that we kept we could then bring people in and build like a real kind of like functional and sustainable business that now sustains all of our you know livelihoods as working artists um and you know and I will also say like a, one of the biggest things for me that 
uh, appeals about the worker co-op model is that it is always a work in progress. And so like, this is not like, we have not by any means like figured it out. We've like screwed up a thousand different ways. Every new member that comes in is like, you are like, there's a giant thing wrong over there that like you need to look at, which we then do. And we like make up a whole new thing to like address that. So, you know, it's not like we've like figured out the perfect system of like avoiding. And also we exist within, you know, racist, sexist capitalism. And so this is like, and it's, it's in the air everywhere. And so we find ourselves replicating all of those things by accident all the time. Um, and so, you know, it's very much a process to like, to grow and to learn, but I feel very grateful that the worker co-op model and allows us like the power to then to like make those changes, like by agreement as a group, as we learn new things and figure out how to do what we're doing better. Um, so is it, do you feel like replicable or is there something unique about your guys's friendship? Like, is like how, I wanna make a co-op, is it possible? Like how, you know, for our industry, does that make sense? Also, it's not just me, I'm seeing people in the comments that are really interested in it's our, so just so you know. Um, yes, like 100% replicable. And I think this is like a wonderful moment to do it because there are like the worker co-op, you know, all, like US Federation, you know, na nationally. And then like, depending on where you're located locally, there are also wonderful, robust local networks in many parts of the country. There are so many more resources to do this now than there were when we started. Like when we started, we felt like we were making something up and which of course we weren't, there was a long history. We just didn't know it. Um, uh, but now if there are, there are incredible resources there you know and um there are so many models and you know i will say like for us the um uh uh selk you know ricardo's organization like was going to uh, that legal tools for worker clubs workshop in new york and like whenever that was like many many years ago was one of the things that and the wonderful like resources that they shared in terms of like here's like literally just three different co-ops operating agreements in full, like use them, you know? And so then now we've been like, we've shared back our operating agreements because I do, I feel like it's really important that like, it's really important that we, um, yeah, that we show that this is replicable and that there are that like, there, it, it doesn't, it doesn't need to be the way that it is that so many of us have experienced it in this industry. Um, and uh, yeah, and those resources do exist and are out there. And I encourage everyone to, yeah, to reach out and also to reach out to, to me, I could put my email in the chat um, this is as particularly for folks that are interested in like the media co-op space, um, you know, happy to share the resources that that we have as well. Yeah, that's great. And I think also a good seg to Ricardo, because I believe a lot of the stuff that he does is coaching people and giving them advice on on how to do that. Uh, so maybe Ricardo, you can tell us a little bit about what your work is um specifically and also just because i'm also in oakland like is it helping oakland or is it more of a national focus yeah sure thanks um it's definitely helping oakland so that's a yeah well hopefully that's my that's our intention we need some help um, right now so yes yeah. what we need some help right now yeah yeah we do for sure um so some of the work that I do at, at, and the Sustainable Economies Law Center does is providing like these types of resources. So um, I, don't know, I just want to like caveat that all of these resources, all the things um, that are that's being said by Zada and um, can, is like talking about the experience that so many people are bringing, all the lessons that they're learning, and and we're all making mistakes. Like our democracy is so brittle, like our ability to like live into a democratic practice is so like thin that doing all these things is, is like an experiment. And it's, and for me, the way that I approach this work is that, you know, like they're talking about in the film about um, the climate catastrophe and all of these different interlocking systems of oppression. It's like cooperatives and community control and democratic practices are the ways that we're gonna be able to come together to actually mitigate the harm that's being imposed by us. So we're, try we're trying to create the resources to allow people to recreate and replicate these models. Um, and so whether it's providing direct legal advice and consultations, like we do three times per month, free legal, that we call them the Resilient Communities Legal Cafes. So anybody from around the country can come and talk to us. Um, and we're only licensed to practice law in California, but if you're from, you know, like Tennessee or Wisconsin or somewhere else, like we can still talk about the different models that we know so that, that you know, you or whoever can, can go to an attorney in your, in your state and actually work with them. Um, 
but a lot of this stuff is like applicable around the country, the, the models and the structures and, and those types of things. Um, we do policy work. So we've been really successful at the municipal level um, on getting like, you know, symbolic things like resolutions passed and, and things like that, but also actually incorporating um, line items into the city budget on supporting worker cooperatives, not only um, supporting the development of new startup worker cooperatives, but also outreach to existing businesses to sell to their employees and create um, and convert to, to worker cooperatives and democratic employee ownership. So that's some of the work that we've done and at the state level trying to create some uh, friendly worker co-op like legal entities and things like that. As I'm saying all this stuff around politics, I'm just like thinking about um, one um, one mayoral uh, election that happened yesterday in Buffalo, New York. I have some friends and um, dear ones who worked on trying to get India Walton, a democratic socialist, um, elected to mayor there. And I'm just like kind of heartbroken by that. Um, but I also know that there were some wins for, for the left in other places. Um, so anyway, that's a little bit about Selk and a little bit about the work that I do and, and the stuff that I just really love that like brings me to life is being able to do the like training and education um, and both like for worker cooperatives and worker owners, but also for attorneys to become competent to like provide these services to folks around the country. So, yeah. yeah, someone is saying too soon and I am also feeling that as well. Um, but speaking of the political landscape, I'm wondering, like, is that a place that you see like needing further pushing or is that sort of um, like what's politically possible for economic democracy? Where do we go with that? Yeah, thanks. I, I think this is the pandemic was really this like zero gravity moment where everything was just like thrown up in the air and we have all of these possibilities, like all of the boundaries and the, and the challenges were shifting. And so I think we're coming to a place where people are starting like those, that zero gravity moment is starting to come back down to earth and things are falling. And so there's definitely been some movement. I mean, we had universal basic income in this country for like a couple moments, you know, how that wasn't even conceivable before, um, before COVID. And so I think there's a, just a different political terrain that we're working with. Um, and I think it's a both and like we, we, I know it's like really disheartening and, uh, for when we lose political, um, campaign and I know that politicians won't save us, you know, like we can't make them saviors. Um, but what we can also do is build political power to actually take community control over those resources. Um, and so, uh, I think there's a lot of opportunities for us in the cooperative community. And for me, the cooperative community is a big tent um, of people. Um, so it's not just like socialists, um, like maybe some of the folks on this call, but um, and like, how can we bring people along to actually build political power for, for more community control? And, and like the film was describing, we need to be doing it in all of these different ways. And for all of us, we can just find the space that we're most called to whether it's worker cooperatives or housing cooperatives and land trusts and, um, you know, thinking about all these different ways that these resources can actually be um, our resources, because they are. And so how can we democratically control them in a way that doesn't hurt as much because we've learned some lessons from each other. So I'm really thankful for the Federation staff for putting together such like a beautiful um, and complex uh, series of workshops and discussions today so thanks um you know one of the things that um when i was filming with evergreen was that ricardo not ricardo um i'm blanking on his name de carlo <laughs> ricardo yeah de carlo um and he you know he was like he didn't really know anything about socialism that wasn't specifically important to him as an ideology he just got this job. It ended up being awesome. And then he learned all about co-ops and ended up loving co-ops. He's no longer at Evergreen. He's at a different co-op. He's like, oh, co-ops are the way um, and the light and the path. Um, and so I'm wondering if you can speak to sort of the relationship between co-ops and socialism um, and that culture and overlap. Uh, if, there, if you see any or if you don't, um, why don't you? Anyway. 
Sorry, you want to take this one or? I don't know if we lost uh, Yeah, I'm sure we all have thoughts on this. I'm sure everyone on this call has very interesting thoughts on this that, is, that are equally as like, you know, relevant and uh, that as any of us, but like for my personal thoughts, like I feel like, um, I feel like, you know, I came to the worker co-op, um, like I came to the art project, like from a political place and, but like many of the, my colleagues that have come into the co-op since then, like have, have a different trajectory. And I think both ways, are totally valid and I think regardless of what path you take they are like the experiences of um building building a worker co-op and like figuring out like how to survive within capitalism and what that can actually like feel like like that is like a political and like politicizing experience and like I think that um and so like for me like a big part of why I'm interested in like continuing my work in the co-op is that like I like I, I feel like I, I'm like building towards a long term. Like I'm trying to build the skills that I, that I feel like we need to survive in the future that it is that like we want, like the far away future. And so it's like we have to learn how to do the, like how to work together collaboratively in a different way than like many of us have experienced, like in other places within our cultures, like through, um, and 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 a way to do that is through just participating in that type of work in our daily lives in these uh, in these ways. And so for me, that once you kind of experience like what that can feel like, then like then there is a desire for it to be everywhere and that like all of the other aspects and the ways in which like your like our lives are um you know where we don't have that that you know, where we don't have power where we don't have what we need where we're not working together like no longer it feels untenable and so to me like it is totally connected and i also like just for my kind of political beliefs like i feel like they're like you know i'm there's like the prefigurative like strategies which is like what this co-op stuff is it's like we're, we're like, we're trying to build the future that's not quite here yet. And then there's all the oppositional work, which is that like, in the meantime, we have to like fight for the policies that are about that, like, will like allow people to live with dignity in all the different ways right now, which some of them have to do with co-op stuff, but a lot of them don't. And it's all the other stuff that is impacting all of our communities. And like, you know, on the one hand, just go in whatever place the spirit moves you. But if you can like be in both places, because like both of those types of work, like are, um, yeah, to me, it's just like all part of the same project and like, can't, like really be separated. Sorry, I muted myself because my child is screaming in the background. Um, Ricardo, could you speak to that as well? I'm going to mute myself again. Um, I, will, I like, sorry, I got the kind of sorry in the, in your response. I totally forgot the question, but, um, <laughs> Just about the relationship, I guess, between socialism and worker owned co ops. I know, like, a lot of the people just in the socialist world that I interviewed for the film were like really adamant that like co ops were not socialism and like it was like a distinctly different thing. And then there were some people that I interviewed that were like, oh, co ops are socialism. Like, that's actually what it looks like. Um, and, you know, I, don't I don't know the the answer so I included all voices but you know maybe you guys do know the answer uh, thanks for, thanks for that context setting um and then maybe after I respond Eric can respond um the what was it yeah this is such an interesting debate and I've actually I've I've wrestled with it because I think there's some serious um critique within there and I appreciate it where um people are talking about worker co-ops aren't socialism. They're just a way to make many capitalists because what co worker cooperatives do is create people who are, they're incorporating a disciplining aspect on workers for them. Like they're internalizing the disciplining force of the marketplace, as opposed to a boss that you can externally point to and say, you're bad, you know, you're, you're disciplining us, you know, where, um, and there, there, if there's a legitimate critique there and, I honestly don't know how to sometimes take that critique on good faith when the whole point of a socialist economy is to put workplaces into workers' control and hands. So there's that contradiction. And I think that's one of the things about cooperatives for me is that what they do is they surface those contradictions in a really explicit way. But then we as workers, uh, I mean, I work at a nonprofit, but we're democratically run, we're cooperatively run. and so these contradictions we get to decide how to confront them and how to navigate them um, and so that power is really um, if you can feel it when you're deciding these things together and sometimes it gets messy and honestly we've been through some messy conversations 
this last year at the law center around like how to navigate certain issues. Um, and those times it's like, I have to like bring myself back to this, like, like I said earlier, we are so inexperienced at practicing democracy that we're going to make mistakes and that's okay. And, and I think that's why this work is so intersectional. Um, like Sarah was talking about earlier, it's like we're all of these systems of oppression, we are like inadvertently recreating. And so we need to like both be humble with ourselves about the mistakes that we create or do, but also um, have some humility for our coworkers who are also making mistakes and, and like really trying to build in restorative and reparative types of practices into our organizations. And it's a lot for, it's a lot for one container to hold, but I've seen some like beautiful transformations both for myself and my coworkers, but also the clients and, and folks that I get to work with. So, yeah. yeah. I can jump on. Um, I really relate to you saying beautiful transformations and also uh, it made me think of the way in which I think that co-ops and socialism are linked is that you kind of have to buy into this collective idea of like a shared, a shared goal in some way. Um, I feel like a lot of the way I think about this actually, um, Zara, you're really good at encapsulating stuff. So I'm like, I hear your voice in my head a lot. I'm very privileged to have that voice in my head um but um when we were chatting recently Zara you were saying like you know part of being a mob is is buying in and saying cool I'm gonna like be here through the like hard part and I'm gonna like try to make it better this way rather than just be like you yeah, know this is too hard for me I can't be a part of it you know and you know obviously you have the ability to leave but part of deciding to be a member of a co-op is is that kind of um, commitment. And I think, I think that's something I see a lot in, um, in my experience with socialism. It also ties into something I think um, else you were saying about, um, about the way in which socialism is an imperative that, or maybe I saw this in the comments and it's, it's something that people want to do. It's like, it's the best solution for, for people in a lot of ways. That was something that I think I learned while we were shooting. And um, for, um, for our co-op, it certainly feels like if something is frustrating or hard, we then say, right, but also this is the best way that I can think of organizing myself in this environment for my job, for the work that I'm doing and for, this, you know, these, uh, you know, this creative process that I'm really interested in making a part of my life. So I'm gonna, you know, roll up my sleeves and like figure out how it is to how, how I need to communicate with my coworkers about it, to communicate with the people outside of my organization about it um, and, and, and make that palatable and, and kind of remind myself and everyone else that this is the best thing. <laughs> and every time we do that, I feel like we're rewarded. You know, like our favorite clients, the people who make our job actually sustainable are the people who are like, I'm deciding to work with you because you guys are this model that I think should be everything. And that's always so encouraging. It's like, ah, oh, great. We're in the right place. We're not just like kind of hiding this part of ourselves so that the per person will be proud or like, like the product, you know, it's very much like they're with us because they're part of that journey. They also want to do that at their place of business or whatever it is. Um, thank you guys all for answering. That was helpful for me. I hope it was helpful for other people. Also, you guys are so cool and smart. I'm glad that you three were helping me with this project and are my friends that I'll see in person one day, maybe. <laughs> Maybe soon. Um, I'm just looking at some of the questions also that are coming in. So I want to ask like one or two, but I know that we're running a little getting towards the end. Um, here is one. Um, do you all think that there is a more united or divided political left in the US today, and specifically more unity and division between economic strategies of defense through unions and defense through worker co-ops against capitalist class? Um, has the great alienation of things like social media also divided the left more than united? It's a pretty big question. I don't know if you guys have a thought on it at all. <laughs> and Ricardo, say something. Uh, I mean, I can, uh, but 
I think there has been some movement um, to work more with unions to both from a sort of like, how can worker co-ops and unions work together? How can we create some more, how can we create more unionized worker cooperatives as a model, particularly a model that can scale so that um, because um, in particularly in the Mondragon experience where these worker cooperatives have become tens of thousands of, of worker owners, they've at a certain level, the democratic practices start to um, fall away. And so there they've created these social councils that basically create advocacy um, like formations for the workers when they're trying to discuss business strategy and things like that. Um, and so in, in the United States context, unions could play that role. So in trying to figure out how can we scale um, worker ownership and worker cooperatives. Um, but then it's also how can unions become more like cooperatives? How can they actually be democratic? How can they actually engage members in between the, the contractual negotiations that unions are legally like created to do? Um, and that's another thing that I think there's more and more union members who are recognizing um, that they want to be more engaged with their unions um, and that the legal infrastructure actually creates um, conditions where unions are, are specifically made just to do those labor negotiations and to quell strikes. Like that's their whole legal like um, point with the Wagner Act and, and the National Labor Relations Board and those types of things. So. Um, there is, I've seen with my union friends, really this like democratizing aspect to to that space. So whether or not that's a more or less divided left, um, honestly, I, to that question, I think we're becoming, there's more people on the left who are like less, you need to do it this way or else you're doing it wrong. And more people saying we need a diversity of tactics. Um, so. Yeah, I think <clears throat> diversity of tactics sounds um, what I've been saying when I've been getting yelled at during some Q&As from <laughs> some people on the left. I had yeah. one last night yeah, and I yeah. was just like, I'm so excited for your film. Like everyone should be doing films about socialism and yours is gonna be like, like no snark, like please go do that. Like we had all political projects like are, in, are, are required, I think at this point. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, do we have like, mm. I know it's hard also just because I'm also feeling bummed about yesterday's election results. Um, mm. So this is a little hard for me, but I wonder if we can think of some recent wins on the road to democratic socialist economy um, that we can mm. build off of. Um, mm. 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 <laughs> yeah, damn it. Yeah, I know I anymore. No, I well, my sister in law was running and she was <laughs> lost in the Somerville slate. So my whole family were just all a little bummed about that. Um, I have a big positive win that I was witness to. Um, this rep, a city council member uh, for District One, which is like the entire southern half of or, and everything below Houston in Manhattan. It's like a huge, it's like 165,000 people. And um, this is a guy who I've been making a documentary about his brother for four or five years. Um, uh, it's co-production with Meerkat. Um, and we watched him make a run several years ago and almost get it, but like the big machinations of like Tammany Hall, New York, which like kind of still exists, like were just put against him. And then he ran for the primary this year with like a lot more support and a lot more like you know vitriol and knew how to fight the fight and he went in a complete landslide and his all his his points are, are like his platform points are like about land use and all these issues that are like actually the issues that relate to what a socialist agenda would be um basically anti you know rapacious capitalism and oriented towards what the community actually needs and he has like a ton of power in a really important part of the of the city. And he's from there. He grew up on the Lower East Side, like, and now he's just in charge of it. And it's really exciting and really heartening to see. His name is Christopher Marte. Um, definitely look him up and um, yeah, donate to him slash go volunteer with them if you live in New York. <laughs> Oh, 
Um, yeah, um, I want to make sure that we wrap up here as we're getting to the end. I did see somebody lifted up a wonderful thought about basically just sharing um, what was pleasurable about making this film and how to make uh, justice the most pleasurable experience humans can have. The quote by Adrienne Marie Brown. I just wanted to hear if you could give me a, a sentence or so about what was pleasurable about working on this film before we end. I would love to hear that. Um, well, you know, I worked on it for like four years. So there's, there's no shortage of really uh, pleasurable. Frankly, the whole part was awesome. That, that end and, and it coming out during COVID was, was not, but right. But what was so great, I would say, you know, what Eric sort of alluded to in the beginning were these really early meetings that we had like on whiteboards before we had shot anything and just like being able to dream um, about what were the important elements for it to look like. And just thinking about that now and it's like, oh yeah. And then we did, <laughs> like, you know, then we made it, uh, you know we didn't include some of those weird ideas, um, but that's for the next one. Um, yeah, and getting to talk to all these people. I see other people, someone's talking also about the AIT union stuff, which I think is also um, like awesome. I think right now, like maybe it's hard to look to electoral politics, but I think like union organizing is, is where I'm feeling um, a lot of hope um, right now, so. Cool. Are we done? Do we, do you guys yeah. want to? Yeah, let's end it there. Thanks. Um, I just want to say thank you everyone for coming. Thanks so much for being here, especially to those of you here, Ricardo, Eric, Zara, and Yael for answering our questions. It's so great to have you here. And uh, we've got two more days of worker co-op week. If you've registered, you should be getting the email with the links to join the sessions tomorrow morning and Friday morning. Um, if you're having any issues with that, you can just reach out to the conference at usworker.coop address, and I will be behind that to help you figure it out. But otherwise, I will see you tomorrow. And thank you for this wonderful event. I'm so appreciative of it. Thank you so much. And just someone was asking some things and just say that you can go to the film's website, socialismmovie.com, uh, which has links to all of our social media stuff. And also then you can email me directly about where to uh, get a hold of the film. It's currently rentable on like iTunes and Apple Plus and stuff. Um, and all the links are on our website. Um, and then if you want to do other screenings like this, you can just email us there. Um, and we are excited to be doing that. So thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for saying that. Um, I'm sure Raquel will also make sure that information is sent out through our channels. We have that stuff in our comms, kind of uh, in our database. I don't know what I'm saying anymore, but we'll definitely send that out too. Yeah, thanks for reminding me to do that. People should know how to I'll get just it. Jump, I'll just jump in and say one last thing I get a lot of joy out of is when we prepare ourselves through a lot of the work that Zara does, a lot of the other co-op members, to have these resources ready to be able to describe our experience to other people who are curious it like sets us up for such a joyful conversation in which we're like we do this thing and this thing and here's what you could do and here's a doc and here's a resource and that is a really like that is a a like emotional experience that is related to this practically you know this very practical thing that and then becomes this emotional experience so i'd, I'd recommend everyone do that if you want some joy <laughs> and i wanted to just answer the pleasure question too to also i was going to lift up the same thing that um someone else in the chat was saying like thank you so much for including the example of the oklahoma teachers as being inspiring and i'll say like for me um like her uh stephanie's story is definitely the piece of the project that i like that brought, that i kind of cared the most about and brought me the most um joy and like, for me a big part of like what i love about getting to make films is getting to just like learn about incredible people and their work um and just like be with them um in their work and and then yeah and be inspired by them so that's definitely the most pleasurable piece of it for me thanks everybody thank you